just stay standing for one more second. Just stay standing for one more second. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Come on, guys, there's somebody who's fighting for you and he never quits on you and he never abandons you. And then even when you're having a bad day, he's still winning victories for you. Is that good news, church? Come on, give God a shout of praise. You can be seated hey, tonight. Uh, this weekend, we are talking about the best fight in scripture besides the cross. It is the epic story of good and evil between David and Goliath. We've been working our way through 1 Samuel and we talked about King Saul walking away from God. We talked about uh, King David last week being anointed uh, to be the next king. And now tonight we are on 1 Samuel 17. So if you have a Bible, go to 1 Samuel 17. We're talking about the most epic battle in the history of the planet besides Jesus' victory over Satan at the cross. David versus Goliath, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna do it. Lord Jesus, thank you, you are the God of victory. Thank you that you go before us, that you are the one who is the cloud by day and the fire by night. Thank you that just like you showed yourself real to the Israelites, you are always showing yourself real to us if we will open our eyes and see you. Thank you that you clear the way. Thank you that you are victorious. Thank you that we have nothing to fear when we walk with you. You are Savior and God and Lord, mighty in battle and strong in power. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me by your word. Lead me now, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. So I was praying. Uh, the first song I started, I'd finished the dedication, uh, the dedications, and I walked away for just a second to pray while the first song was going on. And as I'm praying, I just felt like God, God said to me, I felt like the Spirit of God just said to me, you are the right people in the right places to accomplish his mission. Come on, say, I'm the right person. Come on, say it again, say, I am the right person. You are the right person that God wants to use to accomplish something great for his kingdom. I want you to know he doesn't need somebody else. He's not looking for anybody else. He's looking for you. Come on, say, he's looking for me. And that's why I like this, this text uh, David versus Goliath, we're going to start by reading. This is 1 Samuel 17, verse 1. It just says, the Philistines now mustered their, mustered their army for battle. Uh, Saul countered by uh, gathering his Israelite troops near a valley called Ella. So the Philistines and the Israelite forces faced each other on opposite hills with the valley in between. I'll show you a picture of the valley. This is a modern image of that hill. Um, so uh, the highway that runs in Israel through here, usually when we stop in Israel, we're like stopping right about here with our bus, and then we just kind of walk through this valley, but this is, on one side, you have the Israelite army. I, I think it's actually the other way around. I think this side was the Philistine army, and on this side was Saul's army. I could be backwards. But this, in the middle right here, this, this, this what is now just a wheat field, was where David fought Goliath. In fact, archaeologists go there, and they dig up spear tips, and they dig up chunks of metal, and they find old artifacts from that battle from 3,000 years ago that happened somewhere around 1050 B.C., and they're still finding artifacts from thousands of soldiers fighting each other at that spot. Now we'll keep reading. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and bronze coat of mail weighing 125 pounds. So that's the shoulder pads and set of armor he's wearing into battle. 125 pounds just of equipment. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Uh, somebody has done the math on this. The spearhead weighed 15 pounds. The oak shaft would be 10 feet long, two inches thick, approximately another 10 pounds. The counterweight on the opposite side would have been about six pounds for a total weight, uh, or a total of 12 feet, 31 pounds. That's just the spear he was able to throw. So dude is a monster throwing a 31 pound spear Accurately, that, that takes skill. That takes a lot of muscle. Uh, we'll keep reading. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. I'm just gonna stop you, this is awesome. So that means technically the battle of David and Goliath is actually two against one. There was a guy with a shield that was as big as Goliath going in front of him to guard him. So you have this giant shield and Goliath walking behind it and Goliath shouldn't stood and, and, and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites, and I'm just gonna stop and just remind you, that's what the enemy always does. Your enemy is always wanting to taunt you. You're never gonna succeed. 
you're never going to do anything great. You're such a failure. You're never going to conquer that addiction. You're never going to get past that bad behavior. Don't you know that you're never going to? And it is always the enemy that is never God. That does not, we know our God is the God of victory, that our God fights for us, that our God encourages us, that our God helps us, that we overcome with the power of the Spirit. Come on, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Okay, cool. Uh, this is what he's shouting. Why did you come out of fight? I'm the Philistine champion. You're only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him, we'll be, uh, we will be your slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Then Israel and the Israelites, then Saul and the Israelites heard this and they were like, uh, you go, no, you go, no, you go. <laughs> they were all saying, I'm not the guy for this fight. I'm not right. I can't possibly be the guy. I can't. I couldn't be the one to be used. It's, like, it's got to be somebody better than me. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champions strutted in front of the Israelite army, and nobody fought. 40 days, this Israelite army is terrified of the opposing ranks. Now, I'm going to skip a couple verses, and this is where David shows up in the story. And David left the sheep from, with another shepherd. Remember, he was a shepherd that was anointed to be the next king. I talked about it last week. And set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. Jesse's his dad. He arrived at the camp. He's probably about 14. I told you this already. He's not old enough to serve in the army yet. Uh, he hasn't had his bar mitzvah. So he's probably 13 or 14 years of age. That's all. Because uh, he's just bringing food to the, to the soldiers. He arrives at the camp. This is the Israelite army. He was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. They're like pumping each other up. Yeah, we got this. Even though they're like terrified of Goliath. Um, soon the Israelites and the Philistine forces faced each other. Army against army. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as, this is amazing, as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in what? I'm only going to give you like six thoughts on this battle on how giants fall, and this is the negative one. And we got to spend some time on this one before we can get to the positives. And that's this. Number one, giants don't fall when there's a bystander effect. Giants don't fall. I'm going to say bystander effect. If you are unfamiliar with the bystander effect, here is the definition of a bystander effect. The greater number of people present, the less likely people are to act and take responsibility. This is not some spiritual concept. This is psychology. So if you get a whole bunch of people in a space, everybody's always like, you do something, you do something. No, you do something. I can't be the one. And that's what's going on in the, in the Israelite army. They all think somebody else should do it, even though they're all soldiers. Now, the bystander effect actually comes, it's a, it's a symbol in psychology that, or a, a term in psychology that came from the 1960s, because in 1964, a woman by the name of Catherine Kitty Genovisa, was brutally murdered, murdered on the streets of New York City. 38 people witnessed the crime. 38 standing in their windows, on their balconies, and on the street, witnessed her being raped and murdered. It went on for about an hour Nobody called the police. The attacker, finally thinking he had finished her off, left. So she laid on the street and cried for help for 30 more minutes. So he came back and finished the job. And still no one called the police. This made the papers across America for days. How could nobody do anything? Why would nobody at least call the police or run to her aid or try to help her? How could 38 people watch this and do nothing? And so psychologists started to get together and go, what, what, what would cause human beings to not act in the face of a crisis? And so they tried an experiment. In fact, later on in the next couple years, they had this experiment in which they had a doctor's office and they had people coming in for their visits to the doctor's office. And what they would do is they had a little vent in the corner of the doctor's office and they would spray smoke through the vent. Well, you know, you're waiting in the doctor's office, sometimes it takes forever to get, like, get to get seen and so you're sitting there and sitting there and all of a sudden, smoke is pouring through a vent. 
And they were just trying to see what would these people in the doctor's office do when they experienced the smoke. And here is the results of this experiment. We actually have them. If one person was present, 75% of the time, a report of the problem was explained. If three people were present, 38% of the time somebody reported the problem, and in larger groups of more than three, only 10% of the time did anyone do anything at all. Why? Because they're sitting there in this room looking at each other going, oh, that must be normal. Nobody's doing anything. I guess, I guess that's what's supposed to happen. Like, it's just, it's, I guess, I guess it's pretty, if somebody was supposed to do something, like, there's got to be somebody who's supposed to be in charge. And I'm not in charge. So I'm just, I don't really know. And this might sound stunning to you, but this is human psychology. If you get a group bigger than three people, everybody wants everybody else to act. Yeah, we really should do something. You should do it. <laughs> In fact, there are three things that causes the bystander effect. It's not in your notes, but I, I thought it might help you a little bit. We, first of all, we assume it's somebody else's job. Saul's men keep thinking, somebody else should do something and go defeat Goliath. Maybe we assume it, somebody else would be better at this. Saul's men kept thinking, I, I'm not big enough or strong enough or good enough. I can't possibly be the right person to fight this giant. Or number three, we assume that we will or we are or will become victims. Saul's men believed they were going to lose. You realize you can use your faith for positive or negative things. They sat there in the army and believed they were going to lose. We can't possibly defeat Goliath. I don't have the right talents. Somebody else is more qualified. And so nobody did anything for four, everybody say bystander effect. This is absolutely, totally true in the life of a church. So they say that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. In fact, examples of this in the church, it, uh, when it comes to time, someone, someone's got more time to volunteer than me. I, I'm just way too busy to help. I, I, I'll just end up an exhausted victim, you know? Talent. Well, somebody's probably more qualified than me. I, I, I used to play an instrument, but I don't really play that anymore. I'm not that great at it anymore. You know, I'm just not really that good at it. I, I'll fail. Do you know that uh, we haven't had a keys player in Elk River for several years? A couple years now. And we would love to have keys players, but I, there are keys players there's like, oh, I'm just not good enough to be on that stage. <laughs> Come on, say I'm the right person for the job. You, you have more skill than you're letting on. You have more qualifications than you know. You are stronger than you're th you think. How do you ever experience miracles if you never get involved? How about treasure? Others got more money than me. I'm, I'm, I'm way too broke to be a blessing. You know, like somebody, somebody will do something. At least I hope they do. Because I want to be here next week and I hope they can have the lights on. <laughs> Rather than just saying, well, I'll do my part. I could do something rather than nothing. Or testimony. Others are more qualified. I don't, I don't really know how to bring up my faith with my friends or, or bring a friend to church. And I would just feel so awkward and weird. And so when he talks about somebody should bring somebody to church to hear the gospel, somebody should do that. Yeah. And then we all applaud. We should reach our city. Ah! You should do that. <laughs> and I'm... I'm kind of making light of it a little bit, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is that when a crowd gets large, people stop involving themselves, and what happens is needs don't get met, giants don't fall, and lives don't get changed. Some of you are going, but whoa, whoa, what do we do about this? How do we stop this? How do we stop the bystander effect? Well, the rest of this, this whole rest of this passage is about how you defeat the bystander effect so you can defeat a giant. Now we'll keep reading. The rest of these are positive. First Samuel 17, 26. David asked the soldier standing by, Who, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and, end, and ending his defiance of Israel? Like, is there anything? Like, is there some sort of reward for killing this guy who's just a loudmouth? Uh, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Remember, he's only 14. Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him and said, 
Uh, don't worry about this Philistine, David said to Saul. I'll fight him. And re just remember, I told you two weeks ago that King Saul was the, was the tallest person in Israel. He was a foot taller than all the rest of the Israelites. That's one reason they made him king. He was the toughest guy. He should have fought Goliath. But he thought he couldn't do it just like everybody else. And so this 14-year-old boy goes, don't worry about the Philistine. I'll go fight him. Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. He's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have taken care of my father's goats and sheep. When a lion or a bear came to steal a lamb from the flock, I would go over to it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. That's a strong kid. <laughs> You know what I'm I just grabbed the lion by the mouth and beat it to death with a stick. <laughs> I've done this to both lions and bears. He has got a resume that he's like, what's your resume? I kill lions and bears and stuff with sticks. <laughs> I've done this to both a lion and a bear. I, I, I catch uh, mice in traps. <laughs> I've done this both the lion and the bears, and I'll do this to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. He's basically saying the same thing we just sung. Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead, and may the Lord be with you. Number two, giants fall when we step up rather than stand by. Everybody say step up. Step up. Say it again, say step up. step up. You have to see needs as opportunities that God can work through you. You have to see giants as the potential for suddenly a miracle could happen if you would go against the giant instead of just saying in the seats and hopefully maybe somebody else will do it. I'm, pray I'm praying for miracles, praying for people to do stuff, really believe we should reach our city. Man, I'd like to help people. Man, I'd like to be an encouragement. Step up rather than stand by. Come on, say step up. In fact, this is how it goes next. First Samuel 17, verse 40. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream. He picked up five, because uh, if you read the text in full, Goliath had four other brothers. So he's like, I'll take out the one dude, but I know his brothers are going to be super ticked about this. I might as well get four more stones. And he put them in his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, no sword, no armor, no helmet, no shield bearer in front of him to guard him. He started across the valley to fight the Philistines. And that brings me to number three. Giants fall when we use our unique talents and life experience to make a difference. Everybody say unique talents, life experience. I want you to know that you're not the wrong person for the job. God took you through the last 40 years of your life or 30 years of your life or 50 years of your life to get you to the point right now that he could use you. He doesn't waste stuff. The stuff you've been through in the past, the stuff that you've gone through before, God doesn't waste stuff. If you've survived it, if you've overcome it, if you've got past it, you're the right person to be a blessing and help somebody else and be an encouragement. God's not looking for people who got straight A's and they were captain of the football team and that everything they ever tried in their careers always succeeded. He's just looking for people who go, I'll do it. I'll do it. Guys, when we talk about volunteering in, in kids ministry or something, some of you are like, there's no way I don't know the Bible very well. But if you're an adult who loves Jesus and you're excited about the things of God, people will listen to people who were just excited about God. Like, my goal every week is to be like, oh my gosh, this is the best passage in the whole Bible! <laughs> and you keep coming back. <laughs> And sometimes I got to spend a lot of time, you know, on the side learning it and studying it. Or but I just, I, when, you're con when you're excited about something, it's contagious for other people. You don't have to know, in, like, everything. You don't have to have it all figured out. Like, your past doesn't have to be perfect if you, as long as you can pass a background check and, like, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of important <laughs> for kids. But for adults, we have a lot of people that serve here that have been in prison. Not in kids, <laughs> you know, 
we got a lot of people that serve here that have been in prison, that have struggled with addiction, that have overcome things in their past, and their stories are inspiring to everybody. Come on, if you're proud of people who overcame that kind of past, make some noise. Yes. And sometimes people will come to church and they'll sit for years and years and years and nobody gets to learn from that experience. We need you to step up. We need to hear your stories. We need your experience. We need your talents. We need your abilities. You are the right person. They didn't need a soldier to defeat Goliath. They needed a shepherd. They needed somebody who understood how to use a sling and how to throw rocks. That's what they needed. I mean, they just needed an everyday, ordinary shepherd who chucked rocks for a living. And it was enough. You, come on, say, my life skills are exactly what God needs. You are so correct. He doesn't need somebody who's perfect. He just wants you. We'll keep reading. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him. So notice, once again, it's two against one. Nobody ever talks about that when we talk about David versus Goliath. Like, why did this big, tall dude pick on a kid <laughs> with an extra partner? <laughs> Goliath walked out toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this, at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And Goliath yelled, and David replied to the Philistines, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come at you in the name of the what? Lord of what? Yahweh. You just sung about him. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Um, that doesn't seem very politically correct anymore. <laughs> but that's what you need to do with giants. When the enemy comes, comes against you, Scripture says that we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. A second passage of Scripture says that we are able to stomp on snakes and scorpions, which are types of demons. That we crush the enemy. Why? Because we come in the name of the Lord our God. Today the Lord will, cut off, will conquer you and I will cut off your head, I'll kill you and cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole, the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. Notice he's not saying, because I'm going to be awesome. He said, I'm going to show you that there's a real God who does real stuff and he's going to conquer you in front of everybody else. And everybody assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. I'm going to say, this is the Lord's battle. And he will give you to us. I said it a little bit ago, I'll say it again. You can use your faith to defeat yourself all the time. You know, I just believe it's going to be a bad day tomorrow. What's your day going to be like tomorrow? I'm just never going to be, I'm never going to get past this. I'm never going to overcome this. I just suck at that. David has the opposite going on here. He's like, you, you're nothing. God's in my corner. I'm about ready to show you that I'm going to stomp on you. Today's going to be a great day. You're going to see God victorious today. I'm going to overcome with the power of Christ today. See, when you start speaking faith in direct, in, in, in direct contradiction to the enemies you see, you start to make progress. Of course I'm going to conquer this addiction today. I'm going to be sober today. I got God with me. Of course, it's not going to be as bad a day as yesterday was. Why? It's a new day. God is with me. He's for me. Of course, this meeting is going to go okay. God's going to clear the way. It's going to be just fine. I'm going to walk into this business session. I'm going to go into this thing. I'm going to go past this deal, and it's going to be so good. You have the choice every time you're about ready to enter into a battle. You can speak faith and believe God's going to act, or you can basically talk yourself into defeat before it's even happened. That leads me to number four. Giants fall when we believe God will give us the power and the wisdom and the ability to get the job done. 
I just want you to say, believe God will give me the ability to get it done. So let's go back to a, ch a church setting. So people are like, hey, we need you to participate or volunteer or help out or uh, be a blessing. Or, we're like really encouraging you to bring somebody in a couple weeks. And uh, everybody's like, yeah, we should really do that. And they're like, ah, I'm just not really the right person for this. If you go, no, 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 I'm the right person for this. I'm going to go out of here and I'm going to invite my friend and he's going to talk. To, uh, he's going to be open to the possibility of faith and I'm going to bring him in the door and he's going to hear the gospel. I already know in advance. I already know in advance how it's going to go. But what many of us do is the opposite. We talk ourselves in like, I know in advance how it's going to go. He's just not going to be interested. So I'll just, I'm just not going to say anything, you know. And the devil just applauds. Because your giant won and you never even went into battle. You stayed in the foxhole. We got to decide, man, I'm going to war. And I go to war with a warrior. My God goes with me. He goes before me. He surrounds me like a shield. David didn't need an armor bearer because God surrounded him like a shield. Guys, you are surrounded. You are favored. You are blessed. You are righteous. You are holy. He loves you. He's paying attention to you. He's not abandoned you or forgotten you. Of course you're going to be okay. Come on, say, use your faith to walk into the battle and see a victory. Here's how it goes next. This is verse 48. As Goliath moved closer to the attack, David ran quickly to meet him. That is just like the opposite approach from how a lot of us are like, if I could just avoid this meeting for a little longer. <laughs> I know I should talk to my ex, but I really don't want to have this conversation. I really need to make this phone call and apologize. I really need to make an amends to this person. I really need to step up and invite somebody to hear about my Jesus. I really need to go serve in the, in somewhere in the church, or I really need to start this ministry or be involved in this thing. But I'm just hoping I can avoid it a little longer. Guys, giants never fall when we avoid the battle. At some point, you gotta decide, today's the day I'm conquering addiction. In the power of Jesus, I'm getting sober today. Today's the day I'm finally gonna I'm finally serving my church. Today's the day I'm finally going to give a little bit of my resources, trusting that God's going to provide. Today's the day I'm finally going to invite my friend to hear the, like, hear the message of the house of God. Today's the day. I'm just, today's the day. I'm not putting it off anymore. Come on, say, today's the day. Number five, giants fall when we run to the battle and not from it. We just got to decide I'm not avoiding this anymore. And by the way, if you're like me, everybody's like temperament's a little different. I... I don't mind engaging the battle, but then when like somebody pushes back, I want to run away and hide. <laughs> the way Kelly and I work and con like, let's say the two of us have conflict, no, though we never do because we're pastors. <laughs> I'm now lying in church, yeah. So both of us are really strong personalities and both of us think we know right and know, know, know what's best and we're trying to like, we might get into like, some conflict and I got an idea and she's got an idea and we're going back and forth. My, 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 my thing is, as soon as it like turns into like, it feels a little awkward, I'm like, I gotta go. I'm like a turtle. <laughs> and she's like, but just stand up and take it out of water. <laughs> so I'm preaching to myself a little bit. I just, I, I don't like the feeling or the tension or the awkwardness. And some of you feel the same way about inviting a friend to church or maybe serving someplace or maybe taking a step of faith and adventuring out to a new business or a new career or a new concept uh, for how to be a blessing. And because you're, you feel so awkward, the enemy wins. Guys, the world needs you. And the enemy loves for you to just live in the awkwardness. The best thing I can do when I start to hide is to decide, no, 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 I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to go hide in the other room, or I'm not going to, like, decide, I'm going for a drive right now. <laughs> I'm going to go talk to my wife, and we're going to engage the conversation in a healthy and meaningful and loving way, and we're going to work our way through it. Why? Because I love her. And the marriage stays healthy, and we end up with something really beautiful because we are engaging the battle 
versus running from it. Everybody say, don't give in to awkwardness. You're already awkward. <laughs> so am I. We, like, I, I want you to understand, we are all, all just awkward, and we're all, uh, no, nobody does things perfectly, and we always are making mistakes, and so we just lean into the awkwardness. Um, sometimes when I've talked to people who get afraid, I said, y- y- you know what courage is, right? It's just doing it afraid. It's not the absence of fear. It's just doing it afraid. It's the right thing to do. You know you need to do it. So you just, come on, say do it afraid. afraid. This is how the last part of this goes. Or almost the last part. This is verse 49. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the the Philistine in the forehead. The stone stank uh, and Goliath stumbled and fell, fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. So he hits him in the rock, center of the head with a for, in the center of the forehead with a rock, for he had no sword. Then he ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Notice he didn't kill him till he cut his head off. He just stunned him. All it was was a stunning. Boom! Knocked him. He was so stunned that this kid could do something. He's kind of laying there in shock, going, "What just happened?" And David uses his own sword against him. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Notice that the enemy flees if they just see one of their own go down. Sometimes, if you will just stand up in the battle and win just a little victory, come on, guys, the enemy is going to go. It's going to flee. Every victory matters. And they turned and they ran. Then the the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and they rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, which is actually the Philistine cities. He chased them all the way back into their own cities where they closed the doors and hid in terror. Which leads me to number six, my last thought. As giants fall, others will rise up. Come on, say others will rise and fight next to you. See, so what happens is the bystander effect says, no, don't, don't, don't like start moving yet because that's what happens is I get to numbers. Oh, we're done with notes. No, 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 just stay safe. I, this, is, this part matters. When the bystander effect is in full effect, nobody does anything. People get wounded and hurt rather than miracles and help. But then when one person is like, no, I got this. Somebody else goes, oh, if they can do that, I can do that. I'll give you a simple example. So, back in 1997, I was in seminary. I was working on my master's degree. And I found this book. It was called The Purpose Driven Church. Later on, he wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren. Uh, And this Purpose Driven Church book just told his story about how he was a college student who moved from Texas to California and started a church. I'm just reading his story about, like, what? Somebody did this? No way. And he went to this town and he walked into the realtor's office and he's like, I'm looking for a house. Uh, my stuff's all in the, the van out there and I, I, don't, I don't know where I'm living yet. And you're my realtor, you're also the first member of my church. That's what he told the guy and he became the first member of his church. See the faith there, you feel the, see the strength there? And I was like, this is what I was thinking as I'm reading this book. I don't know who that guy is, but if that guy can do it, I can do it. I remember saying it to myself. I remember writing down, if that guy can do it, I can, I can do that. Where would I start? I don't know. Where am I going to get the money? I don't know. Where am I going to get the people? I don't know. But if that guy can do it, and it was enough. Tonight, let this little story of David inspire you. If that guy can do it, you can do it. If that guy can start something, you can start something. If that guy can volunteer, you can volunteer. If those people can give, you can give. If that guy can serve, you can serve. If that guy can talk to his friends about faith, you can talk to your friends about faith. If that guy can open up this new venture or try this new thing or accomplish this new business plan, if that guy can do it, they're not smarter people than you. They're not better people than you. They're not more qualified people than you. They just had the faith to say, I'm doing it.
leads me to the last thing I want to say tonight. So, two weeks from now, everybody say two weeks from now. On October 16th and 17th, we need 15 new people to step up and serve uh, our kids so we can reach the next generation. Why? Because we're going to four services. We don't want services to always be this full. Why? Because our goal isn't to fill up a room, our goal is to reach our city. So in two weeks, there'll be services at five on that weekend, at five and at 6.30, which means the services are gonna feel small again, but I like it when they're full and everybody's here and it's so lively and fun. I want you to feel again what it feels like to plant a church. To feel the point of what church is all about. It's to reach people out there, not just celebrate in here. And so two weeks from now, we're gonna launch two services on Saturday night and we're gonna take this crowd, which has consistently been full all summer and it's never been like that before. We've never had, had this consistent of attendance all summer long and moving into fall. We're like, whoa, this is good. So we're gonna try that weekend, we're gonna start two services and it's gonna feel small again. And remember, there's less of a bystander effect when you have less people. Woo, yeah. So what that means is we need 15 of you from this service to say, I'll, I'll serve in kids one of those two services. What's great is we, with two services, you can serve one and sit one. Serve one and sit one. We need 15 people to step up and say, I'll, I'll, I'll serve at the door or in the coffee shop or uh, in the shop or uh, I'll pass out programs or I'll help people get seated or uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll run cameras because we need camera operators and people working in the booth. And, uh, or maybe if you're a keyboard player, hint, hint. <laughs> See, look at that. My son's bouncing now. That you would step up and you would serve. That's 30 people. And then we need everyone. Everybody say everyone. So maybe you're like, I, that volunteer part's not. We need everyone that weekend on the 15th and 16th to bring somebody to hear the gospel. Everybody say bring one. Bring one. Come on, say I'm the right person with the right background and the right friends to bring one. You are David and you will defeat Goliath if you just say, I am the right one. And that weekend, we'll go to four services and that's how we will spend our fall going, look, we're gonna, our goal is to reach our city and reach our city and reach our city, not to fill up a room, but to reach the city, and we're gonna invite you to be a part of it. Now, here's how this works for you. When service is over, in just a second, I'm gonna just do a couple announcements and we're gonna wrap up. But rather than you leaving, if you're like, man, I'll, I'll volunteer and serve in one of those ways, either in kids or one of those other ways, can you just stay in the room for a minute? And I wanna get your name and number and uh, one of our directors from those areas will give you a call this week about how you could possibly serve. So when everybody else goes, I want you to think, I'm the one. Come on, say, I'm the one. And when everybody else, like, Bales, I just want you to come sit in the middle section or stay in the room in your seat for just a minute. And when the rest of the crowd empties out, you stay here for just a minute because we're seeking to raise up another 30 volunteers from just this crowd. And I believe you are the right person for the job. Let me pray for you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much that you used a 14-year-old boy to defeat a giant. And when everybody else stood by, one stood up. May that be our character. May that be our calling. May that be our heartbeat. And may it be contagious and rub off on others. May somebody in this room tonight look at their friend and say, I'm staying in the room because I, I want to talk about volunteering with somebody else. Like bring a friend along. Lord Jesus, I, I pray for people who need to get baptized, that they would, they would step up and get baptized. I pray for people who need to follow you with their lives. They would give their lives to you tonight. I'm just going to end with a final prayer. I want you to pray it out loud. We say, Lord Jesus Christ. I am available and ready. Use my life. Do something good through me. Like you used David, here I am. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Just give you a shot of praise right there.